Good evening, my fellow Americans. I'm here to talk to you tonight about a simple idea. One that seems so obvious at first that you may think, why in the world do we need to talk about it at all? But I promise you, standing here today, that this may in fact be the single most important issue facing our great democracy. The issue from which our greatest threats grow, and yet one that, by facing it together, we can find a way forward through the darkness to a better day. The idea is simply this. Words have meaning. Let me repeat that. Words have meaning. Now you may think this notion is so self-evident that there must be some kind of trick coming. I assure you that there is not. And the fact that you fear that is a symptom of the very problem that I want to talk to you about tonight. In my adult lifetime, I have seen a phenomenon rise and take hold in this country in a way that would have seemed inconceivable to an American of the 1970s or before. I'm talking about a perversion of language. Not in the sense of how well a person speaks, or if a person talks in a coarse or vulgar way, but rather the purposeful subversion of the objective meaning of the words that make up our English language. Language developed to facilitate communication between people. And for that communication to be effective, language had to have words with commonly understood meanings. If I said, please put the baby over on the bed, it was real important that you didn't think I was talking about the cactus out front. We all call a bed a bed, a cactus a cactus, and so on. If the speakers of a language can't agree on fundamental definitions for the words and phrases used in it, then things break down. Communication is compromised. Okay, you may be thinking, Barack, this all sounds kind of academic. What does it have to do with me and the problems I face every day? Well, that's a good question. One reason it's important is because of the pervasive role that media and the internet play in our modern American lives. Like never before, we are bombarded daily by a barrage of information. From the radio when the alarm goes off in the morning, to your newspaper or laptop at the breakfast table, maybe more radio on the way to work, maybe more time during the day in front of a computer screen, and now even a speaker squawking at you when you're pumping gas. With handheld devices becoming more and more prevalent, the information bombardment becomes almost constant. So what kind of information is coming at you all day long? What is the underlying agenda and what tools are being used to push your buttons and who stands to gain? Language is a very fertile thing. The words used to communicate have tremendous power. So what happens when the objective meaning of words is purposely subverted, knowingly corrupted to achieve a certain goal? When right-wing politicians and their propaganda arm at Fox News say that I'm a socialist, do you think they really believe that to be true? Or rather, do they know it full well to be untrue? But their studies have shown that it would be an effective word to use with certain groups of Americans that they want to rile up and divert. For make no mistake, diversion is the fundamental goal when language is perverted in this way. If you are one of the two major political parties in this country, and your core purpose is to further the interests of giant corporations and the very wealthiest Americans, then you know darn well you better have diversion as the main element of your election efforts, or else you'll never get votes from anyone other than those you so obviously serve. And so we get manufactured diversionary issues, expressed with language that goes beyond hyperbole and on into the realm of corrupted meaning, of words knowingly used in a way that is totally divorced from the underlying facts at hand, from the true meaning of the words. My presidency is spoken of in apocalyptic terms, with the sky falling daily from the smallest action I might take or not take. Early in my presidency, a simple broadcast speech to school children about the importance of education, something presidents have been doing for years, caused screaming from the rooftops. Socialist indoctrination, propaganda, won't someone please think of the children? Do you remember this? Absolutely ridiculous. When you hear the word socialist, can you imagine another word they might rather say that cannot yet be spoken openly, even in this poisonous political climate? 
The cumulative effect of this unending landslide of corrupted language is the designed impression that sheer repetition must make it so. It's on the television and radio all day, every day, so it must be true, right? Many of you grew up in a time when we had well-founded FCC regulations in this country that applied to the media. Underlying these laws was the idea that the broadcast airwaves are a finite public resource and that broadcasters do not have an unfettered right to use them however they want to. Rather, because the airwaves are public, they had to be used responsibly under a federal license. One element of those now-gone regulations was known as the Fairness Doctrine, a law designed to ensure fair and balanced information, back before that phrase was tainted, was broadcast to Americans over their public airwaves by holders of FCC licenses. Fox News could not exist today if those regulations were still in effect. It is no accident that the Reagan administration made it a top priority to eliminate the Fairness Doctrine in the 1980s, starting the long, sad slide that has led to the present-day Federal Communications Commission that merely facilitates giant corporate mergers which eliminate competition, drive up prices for consumers, and constrict the diversity of opinion throughout world media. So if you grew up in a time when the airwaves were truly treated like a public resource rather than a corporate playground, then you generally felt like you could believe what was presented as facts in the media. A broadcaster would lose its license if it consistently played fast and loose with the truth. And because those FCC regulations were killed off quietly, without much public fanfare and without any meaningful pushback from Democrats, most Americans don't realize that the game has changed that it is now entirely legal for Fox News to be used as a propaganda wing of the Republican Party without violating the terms of its license to broadcast. And so you hear things again and again and again broadcast at you, and you may well feel that they must therefore be true, because how could they not be? How could they otherwise get away with saying these things with such fervor and righteous anger day after day after day? I knew a man once who liked to argue, a lot. Some of y'all may know people like this. And interestingly enough, he didn't like to lose. Now, he was a pretty smart guy, but he hated to lose way too much to rely on those smarts to win all these arguments. So he made stuff up. Stuff that would be really compelling for the point he was trying to make if it were true. And after a while, it occurred to me that he had been using this technique so long that he no longer knew the difference. He'd lost the ability to know what was really true. The Republican Party today faces a dilemma. They've been playing fast and loose with the truth for so long, ginning up diversionary issues and using corrupted language in their chase for votes from people whose interests they do not serve, that some of their own candidates have now drunk the Kool-Aid, so to speak. They've come to believe in the crazy stuff they're saying to get elected, this deeply worries the Republican establishment because the underlying understanding down in the bowels of that machine has always been that they know what they're doing. They know the tactics they're using to play on people's fears, hopes, disappointments, resentments, and prejudices, and they know that the real goal never wavers. The goal of manipulating our government for the sole benefit of giant corporate interests and the very wealthiest Americans. It has often been said by savvy folks who watch American politics that the worst thing that could ever happen to the Republican Party is to have Roe versus Wade overturned. In private, candid Republican operatives will tell you the same. If you remove the social diversionary issues from the table, then what is left for Republicans to run on other than their real platform, which of course can never be said out loud? And what is the Republican Party to do now with so many of its candidates actually believing that these social issues should be the focus of the party's legislative efforts rather than just serving those who pay for all these efforts to the tune of billions of dollars in contributions to the party? This whole mess has created a bit of a catch-22 for the GOP. And the nature of the tactics they use in these elections is such that they escalate each season. At this point, 
there's a litmus test a candidate must pass in order to be electable in a Republican primary that is almost guaranteed to produce a nominee so extreme that he'll be unpalatable to the majority of Americans in a general election, no matter how much well-funded propaganda is put out there. It would be funny if it weren't so tragic. Funny because the Republicans' deeply cynical tactics have led them to be hoist on their own petard. But tragic because all this creates a dysfunctional government that has no will to address the many serious issues that face us today. Our middle class is disappearing into a new American feudalism, and all those novels and movies portraying dystopian futures with the rich nobles barricaded behind fortified compounds and protected by private gunmen with the rest of the citizenry left to fend for themselves in a broken landscape, do not seem as far-fetched today as they did even 30 years ago. I'm not saying that America will sink to that level, but I am saying that I do not want it to move one inch towards it. Not on my watch. Words have meaning, and they have consequences. In 2003, do you remember the Bush administration's Clear Skies Act? It was actually a subversion of existing clean air laws and a major windfall to corporate polluters. That travesty is not only a symptom of this corruption of language, but it led to real impacts on real Americans. Increases in air pollution resulting in a worsening of direct health effects, as well as contributing to our alarming climate change situation. A situation that's getting worse every day before our very eyes. One wonders if a new Republican-controlled Congress and White House would call new legislation making Protestant Christianity the official United States religion mandatory for all, the Religious Freedom Act. Catholics, Jews, Muslims, Hindus, agnostics, and atheists need not apply. I read online one time, as you may have, a quote from an unnamed Karl Rove staffer during a George Bush presidential campaign which bragged that, largely due to their efforts surrounding that campaign, we now live in a post-factual political world when it comes to American elections. Think about that. A post-factual world. Elections based on purposeful lies that cannot be exposed because the people believing them don't care if they're true. Lies so craftily constructed through the best psychological research that marketing money can buy that they find in their targets willing listeners predisposed to believe just such lies. I implore you to ask yourselves if you may have fallen victim to this tactic. I know you're hurting, and you want answers, and you may well want someone to blame. But take a deep breath and think about it for a minute. Remember that old quote from All the President's Men, that movie about our heartbreaking Watergate scandal of the 1970s. Follow the money. Look to see who really stands to gain from the policies of today's Republican Party. And ask yourself if that includes you, or is likely to include you at any time in the future. You know, I've been accused of trying to foment class warfare when I talk about these things. But is it surprising to you that they don't want to talk about the issue of class when we're living in the age of the greatest wealth inequality in American history since the 1920s. And we all know that the Gilded Age of the 20s ushered in the Great Depression, which almost destroyed this country. Class warfare? At a recent public appearance, I saw someone wearing a button with a very interesting slogan on it. It said, If you think there's no class war, then you're losing it. The war has certainly already been waged, and I assure you I did not start it. But I'm here tonight to tell you that I stand with you in it, on your side in this titanic struggle. Nobody likes being made a fool of, and the longer a deception goes on, the more likely a person subconsciously doesn't want to admit it to himself for fear of having to face how long he believed the lie. But is that prospect worse than the alternative? If people who are ground down by the economic policies of the Republican Party keep voting for them, they'll wake up one day to find themselves mired in a poverty so profound that they have virtually no chance of emerging from it. And that day is almost upon us. Strip away the rhetoric, the lies and distortions and inflammatory talk. 
Look with the critical eye that I know you have and ask yourself who stands to gain, really. Put yourself in their shoes, the billionaires and the politicians they own. How would you run political campaigns that face the perennial problem of getting votes from people who would be hurt by your policies once you're elected? Do you see the answer to that question on the TV today, on the radio or online? Words have meaning. Language can facilitate communication or subvert it. The next time you hear that the sky is falling, that the days have never been so dark and that I'm some kind of crazy socialist who wants to destroy America, ask yourself if that really makes sense. Whose interest does such talk serve? And do the folks doing the talking really have your best interests at heart? Together we can reclaim language just as we can reclaim our nation from parasitic interests who want to continually take, take, take while giving nothing in return. We can reestablish the promise of our great constitution and move forward together as a country where opportunity is truly open to all and where the social contract is real, heartfelt and made manifest in our lives. We can reward innovation while having strict measures in place to curb the endless, rapacious corporate greed that threatens to stamp out everyone but those few up in the penthouse. For it's not class warfare I want for us all, it's class opportunity. Too long has the system been rigged. You feel it and it fuels your anger and despair. Take those feelings and turn them around to energy, to action and resolve. Together we can make this once again a country where the rule of law looks out for the interests of the greater good and the rights of every man, woman, and child, not just the corporate bottom line. Mankind was not meant to be ruled by a legal fiction. We have greater truths to live by, you and I. Together we can march forward and uplift this country to a higher ideal, a higher purpose. I thank you.